Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the SAT Official Study Guide 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today, we'll pick up from where we left off on page number 728. We finished 727 last time. Page number 728, please turn to it. We'll pick up from number 11. If at the end of the video you find this helpful and you wish to wish, wish to work with me, you can always get hold of me at kashwaniprep at icloud.com. Send me an email and we'll see what we can do. Let's look at number 11. We have x raised to negative 2 times y raised to half and on the bottom we have x raised to one third, y raised to negative 1 and we're simply being asked to simplify this thing, which, sim which simply means to make all the exponent positive. So let's do that. We want to make all the exponents positive. If we bring this x squared to the bottom, if we bring this to the bottom, it becomes positive. Or if you like, we can do it underneath here. Let's bring the x down so it becomes x squared, which is positive root, positive exponent. And then we have x raised to one third here. On the y, on the top, we already have y raised to y raised to one half as a positive positive exponent. We need to bring this guy to the top, and when we do that, it becomes positive one. And that's all there is. That's how simple it is. X raised to one half is just square root of y times y raised to one is just y over x squared times x raised to one third, which is simply cube root of x. And that's all there is. Okay, let's look at number two, number twelve. I think I may have to change, get rid of this marker, I think. We'll find out in a second. So we have this parabola. The question simply is, what is the x-coordinate of its vertex? Yes, I think I'll have to retire it. I'll have, I'll, I'll, I'll have to retire it. There was nothing left in it. X coordinate of his vertex. Let's find out, shall we? Let's draw it very quickly. First of all, a, par a parabola. We're just going to draw it freehand. So if you draw a parabola, it, it cuts the x-axis at these two points. The first point where it cuts the x-axis where this guy is going to equal to zero, the function the web function is going to equal to zero, the y is equal to zero when x is equal to negative three. When x is equal to negative three, we get negative three and positive three. So when x is equal to negative three, that's that's the one x-intercept. And the other one is when x is equal to negative one, right here. Exactly halfway between these point, exactly halfway between these two points, negative three and negative one is our line of symmetry. And that is at x is equal to negative 2. The line of symmetry is simply x equals to negative 2. Which means that our vertex is right here and the x coordinate of the vertex, x coordinate of the vertex is negative 2. And that's all there is. All we have to do is now go through all the four answer choices because the question is asking which one of the which one of the four which one of the four answer choices captures the x-intercept of the vertex. A says A says negative four to negative three. Going from negative four to negative three will not capture negative two. B says negative three to positive one. There you go. If we if you have an interval. If you have an interval that goes from negative 3 to positive 1, that will capture negative 2. There you go. Answer is B. Let's quickly take a look at what C and D say. C says, C says 1 to 3. One, going from 1 to 3 will not capture negative 1 and similarly 3 to 4 would not do the job. 
One last thing we're going to do, which is which we are not being asked here, let's just out of curiosity, just out of curiosity, we already have the x coordinate. What is the y? What is the y coordinate of this vertex? Let's find out very quickly. Even though, even though nobody cares, nobody's asking for it, we're going to do it just for the hell of it. So when x is equal to negative two, when x is equal to negative two, negative two and positive three is going to give us positive one, and negative two and a positive 1 is going to give us negative 1, there you go, which equals, which equals to negative 1, which equals to negative 1, there you go, this missing part there, I hope you understand that that was absolutely unnecessary, we were not, we were not being asked to give the y coordinate of the, of the vertex, simply the x coordinate, and the x coordinate is negative 2. Number 13. Number 13, it says x squared minus 2x minus 5 over x minus 3. It says which of the following four answer choices that we see there are, uh, is, equivalent, is equivalent to this expression. Let's take a look at the answer to it, shall we? Well, very first thing, very first thing we should understand, the very first thing we should notice is that, as we find the common denominator, for example, answer choice A says x minus five, x minus five minus minus twenty over x minus three. So, we, I'm not going to go through all four of them. To, uh, to what I'm trying to make you understand is that we. We don't have to do what I'm about to do here, it's unnecessary. We simply have to recognize that they all have the same common denominator. All four of the answer choices, and so does this one. They have the, all, all of them have the same denominator, therefore denominator plays no role here. Writing denominator down each time and looking at it is just a waste of time. For example, if you find the common denominator, the very first thing we have to do is multiply this pi by this guy, x minus 3 times x minus 5 and minus 20. And now writing the denominator underneath is, is not necessary because it's not going to play any role. So we're not going to worry about it. It plays no role. All you have to do is compare the numerator and see which one matches. Well, as you can see, this, answer, this is answer choice A. As, as you can see here, it's not going to work. Because here we're going to get negative 5x and a negative 3x. A negative 5x and a negative 3x is going to give us negative 8x. And that's no good. That's no bloody good. We're looking for negative 2x. That's not going to work. Let's look at answer choice B. In answer choice B, again, same thing. We have this guy and then something else. I didn't even write down in my thing here because it makes no difference. What this is, what this is at that point, we, sh we shouldn't have to worry about it. We have to first worry about the fact that it's not, wor <coughs> that it's not working negative 3x and negative 5x again is going to give us negative 8x we have negative 2x b is not the answer it doesn't work let's look at c c says x plus 1 times x minus 3 minus 8 so here we're going to get our x squared minus negative 3x positive x, there you go, that does work, negative 3x and a positive x is going to give us negative 2x, so far so good, and because, because so far is so good, I'm going to continue the journey, and I, I'm going to continue the journey, and having said that, I'm going to stop it right away, I'm going to end, the, end this journey, because it's not working out, a negative 3 and a negative 8, never in a million dollars is going to give us negative 5, the answer is not, answer is not C, answer has to be D, let's see what D says, And because this is negative five, there is no suspense here as to what the d is going to what the d must say. Of course, we're looking for negative five, and this gives us negative three. Positive one times negative three is negative three. We need negative five. D must have negative two in it. It has to, otherwise it will not work. And of course, that's exactly what it does. The answer is D. The answer is D. Let's look at the next one, number fourteen.
In number 14, we are given We are actually we are not given anything, there is, no, there is no picture there, but if you read the problem yourself, which is why you have to have a book in front of you, you must always read the problem yourself. Because I don't have the luxury of rewriting the entire bloody thing on the blackboard. Not rewriting, rather writing the entire bloody thing on the blackboard, it's too much. So, but if you read the problem yourself, you will see that we are dealing with a rectangular prism. What they, what they are referring to as a rectangular prism. A rectangular prism is just a very fancy way of saying a rectangular box. So let's draw a rectangular box. Here is our rectangular box. We are told that the height of this box is 60. We are told the length is two and a half times the width. Again, this is all in the problem, you just have to read it. And here is our width. We are told that the sum, the sum of the perimeter of the base of the base of this box plus its height plus its height cannot exceed One hundred and thirty inches. That's the requirement. If you want to mail this box, the courier tells you that this is our requirement. We're going to take the measurement of the base of the box and we're going to add the height to it. And if it exceeds one hundred and thirty thirty inches, you can't send it. That's not the, that's not exactly what they say us. They're telling us that the height has to be sixty, the length has to be no more than two and a half times the width. And the question is, what can we infer from that about the width itself? What can we say about the width? And that's what we're getting at. So let's find out, shall we? So let's, let's do that. The, the perimeter of the base is simply the length plus the width, two times the length plus the width, obviously. You can see it on the top here. This, this top is the same, the bottom is going to be the same, obviously. So two times the length plus two times the width, which is the perimeter of the base plus the height cannot exceed cannot cannot exceed 130 which means it has to be less than or less than or equal to 130 I'm going to raise this part right here 2 times the length and the length is 2 times 2 and a half times the width the length is equal to 2 and a half times the width plus 2 times the width plus the height cannot exceed 130 2 times 2 and a half, 2 times 2 and a half is 5, 5 plus 2 is 7, so 7 times the width plus the height cannot exceed 130. And we know what the height is, height is 60 we are told. Let's subtract 60 from both sides, if we subtract 60 from both sides we find that 7w has to be less than or equal to 70, which means w must be less than or equal to 10, voila, that's the requirement. W has to be less than or equal to 10, height has to be less than or equal to 60, and the length cannot be more than two and a half times the width. And if you if you abide by all of these three conditions, what you will find is that the sum of the perimeter of, sum of the perimeter of the base plus the height will not exceed 130. So now we just have to look at the answer choices and see which one works. Answer choice A says that the uh, width is up to 10, which is fine. A works, there you go, because it says less than or equal to 10. B is not going to work. B is not going to work because it says less than or equal to 11 and 2 third. The height cannot be as much as 11 and 2 third. It can't it can even be 11, it can't even be 10 and a half. It has to be less than or equal to 10. C says the width has to be less than or equal to 17 and, 17 and 1 half. I don't know why I'm writing all of them down. You can see them yourself. Only A does the job. Let's look at number 15. We are told that this expression here, 
one third x squared minus two, we are told that this expression that here k can be rewritten as one third x minus k times x plus k. And the question simply is, in that case, if that were the case, in that case, what's the value of k? Well, if this expression can be rewritten in this form, then these two must be equal. So let's work on this side first. Here we have x minus k and x plus k, which is same as a minus b times a plus b, which is simply a squared minus b squared, is a difference of two squares. So here we end up, here we end up with one third x squared minus k squared. Let's open it up. One third x squared minus one third k squared. And on this side we have one third x squared minus two. As we can see, one third x squared and one third x squared, we have it on both sides. We can subtract that from both sides and we are done. Here we have a negative two and here we have negative one third something. If we multiply both sides by negative one, we can get a real negative side. So essentially two is equal to one third k squared, which in turn implies that k squared must equal six. And that in turn implies that k would have to be square root of six. Voila. K has to be equal to square root of six. And that is answer choice D. That's the end of that page. That's the end of that page and that's the also that's also the end of the multiple choice questions in this section. Beginning with question number 16, on the following page, we'll deal with gradient problems and we'll deal with them tomorrow. Again, if you wish to get hold of me, send me an email at kashwaniprep at icloud.com. Alright, bye now.